Very happy that he made it from Irvine, California. Uh, Professor Dr. June Thayer was born in Brooklyn, New York City. And this cat has been around for quite some time, so the introduction is a bit longer. I tried to, I already shortened it this morning. Uh, so he attended the Berkeley College of Music, then went to Indiana University, majoring in psychology with a minor in music, graduate work at New York University in experimental psychology and psychophysiology, was then appointed as assistant professor at Penn State, um, moved to the National Institute on Aging as senior investigator and section chief, then was appointed as uh, the Ohio Eminent Scholar Professor in Health Psychology at the Ohio State University, that's where we met. Uh, was also appointed as Professor of Neuroscience at OSU at the College of Medicine. And just recently, three years ago, two years ago, three, something about that, decided to leave cold Ohio weather and move to California, Irvine, where he is currently a distinguished professor at the Department of Psychological Science. He held various uh, visiting professorships in the Netherlands, Norway, and Italy. Uh, along the long list of awards and uh, recognitions he received, uh, the Humboldt Senior Research Award, the Distinguished Scientist Award from the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback, the Distinguished Scientist Award from the Society of Behavioral Medicine, the Award for Distinguished Contributions to Psychophysiology, the same award um, also of the American Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine. From my understanding, he's the first African American to win this Grand Slam, meaning all distinguished awards from all the American societies in psychosomatic medicine, psychophysiology, and behavioral medicine. Most notably, He's been the bass player at my wedding. Uh, he's a highly cited researcher, published more than 500 papers. He's an editorial board member of many journals in our field, including psychophysiology and psychosomatic medicine. He served many roles in different societies, including presidency of the Academy of Behavioral Medicine Research, and he's the incoming president of the Society of Psychophysiological Research and we jointly will host the next year's meeting in Prague that I'd like to advertise at this point. Uh, I'm very happy to call it a friend and a brother. Here is Dr. Julian Thayer. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, Julian, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I'll be sure to text your mother and let her know. <laughs> uh, I'd like to start with a uh, quote from Charles Darwin's book, Expression of Emotion in Man and Animals, to sort of set the stage for today's events. And he's talking about the work of the French physiologist Claude Bernard who is considered by uh, many to be the father of modern neuroscience. And he says, uh, Claude Bernard also repeatedly insists, and this deserves the special notice, that when the heart is affected, it reacts on the brain. And a state of the brain again reacts to the pneumogastric nerve on the heart. So that under any excitement, there'll be much mutual action, reaction, and reaction between these, the two most important organs of the body. Now, there are a couple of uh, very interesting aspects of this particular quote. So in this book, published in 1872 by Darwin, it's approximately 600 pages, and he's talking about expression of emotion in man and animals. This appears on about page 72. This is the foundation, not the conclusion of that book, which I think is very interesting. And I want you all to reflect for a moment. What did we know in the 1850s about the brain? What did we know about the heart? What did we know about nerves, neurons? How these guys came up with this very specific statement about the relationship between the heart and the brain is a complete mystery to me. Uh, 
I have no idea how they did it, uh, but it has inspired the, the better part of my career. Uh, I was giving a talk last week, and um, it came to me that, well, maybe it was aliens. <laughs> maybe aliens had come down and given them this information. But just to put it into a, a little bit of context, <clears throat> so the EKG machine was in, invented in the 1920s by uh, Eindhoven. And it involved uh, a string galvanometer and buckets of saline. So this is what the trace looks like. And it's a really good signal, if I must say so myself. I mean, this is really quite a nice signal for the original sort of signals. But this is what the device looked like. <laughs> Incredible. And uh, of course, here in Germany, we're not too far from Marburg, where uh, Otto Lubi uh, discovered what he called Wagerstuf, which we know is acetylcholine. And this is a picture of Otto there. And he and Henry Dale won the Nobel Prize for their contributions in uh, 1931, I think it was. So this was 50 to 70 years after Darwin and Claude Bernard made this prescient association between the heart and the brain via what was then called the pneumogastric nerve, we now know as the vagus nerve. So, <clears throat> I want to just start with a little bit of physiology, uh, overview of the autonomic nervous system. It's traditionally thought to uh, involve uh, the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system. Most organs of the body are duly innervated. What's interesting, though, is that the body doesn't know this. This distinction is for our purposes only. The body produces a unified response among all the different systems to environmental challenges. And the uh, distinctions that we make among different systems are for our purposes. They do not necessarily represent the reality that the body is dealing with. So that's very important to keep in mind. So when we're talking about uh, different systems or subsystems, recognize that that's for our purposes. So this is a, a figure showing some of the detail of the vagus nerve. There are uh, actually two. There's a left vagus and a right vagus. They have somewhat uh, slightly different uh, patterns of innervation. Uh, from, the, uh, from this figure, you can see, I don't know if, I, if this is actually a, is this the point? Okay, there it is. Yeah. So, what I want to highlight here is some of the um, outputs via the nucleus ambiguous and the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, and here the nucleus tractus solitarius, which we'll talk about uh, a bit more, and the area postrema, which we will also mention. The notion of autonomic balance has been proposed by many, including uh, Steve o. Julius, and it's a predictor of mortality and morbidity. It underlies a broad range of responses linked to what uh, my late friend Bruce McEwen called allostatic load. Importantly for our discussion today, it's associated with the central nervous system, and it may help explain how psychosocial factors are instantiated in physiology and disease. In addition, it may help to explain known health disparities, both uh, gender and ethnic, uh, disparities, but I will not really talk about that in any detail at all today. Uh, when sympathetic tone is high and parasympathetic tone is uh, low, there are a range of metabolic, trophic, hemodynamic, and thrombotic factors <coughs> that are in play. Uh, at the metabolic level, you get things like uh, insulin resistance leading to things like diabetes and endothelial dysfunction and weight gain, trophic factors associated with 
increased blood pressure, again, with endothelial dysfunction, uh, hemodynamic factors associated with elevated heart rate, arrhythmias, tissue ischemia, thrombotic factors <clears throat> associated with platelet activation and thrombosis. And uh, as you might imagine, these things are generally considered bad for us. So from an evolutionary perspective, why do we still have them? So um, I'm not sure what the figure is in uh, Germany, but uh, does anyone have an idea about what life expectancy was in 1900? Anyone? Any idea? 45 years. It was about 40 years in the US. So these are diseases of longevity. And for the most part, we did not live long enough to succumb to the ill effects of these actually adaptive responses in a threatening environment. So for example, our early ancestors uh, in, in an environment in which food is scarce would want to have weight gain with any food that they have. In the context of an uh, unsafe environment with fight or flight in play, they would need to be able to rapidly mobilize blood pressure and heart rate to fight and flee. And in the case of being injured, they needed their blood to coagulate so they didn't bleed to death. So these were all adaptive functions from an evolutionary perspective. But in the context of modern extended life, they've become deleterious. So the vagus nerve is considered the longest nerve in the body. It's considered the wanderer. Uh, Vegas is derived from the same word as vagabond. Uh, the patron saint of wanderers, by the way, is St. Julian. Claude Bernard was born in St. Julian, France. My name is Julian. I had no choice but to study this. This was my destiny. So in this context, we have uh, uh, developed a model we call the neurovisceral integration model to uh, talk about the relationship between a set of neural structures that can be indexed by a uh, peripheral index of vagus nerve function, heart rate variability, which I'll say a little bit more about. Higher heart rate variability is associated with greater prefrontal inhibitory tone, and a lack of inhibition leads to undifferentiated threat responses to environmental challenges. Basically, the fight or flight stress response is our default response. Imagine our ancestors walking along a path and they encounter something coiled on, on their path. It could be a harmless vine or a deadly snake. What's the adaptive response? Assume it's a snake because if it is a snake and you think it's a vine and you are bit, your genes will not be passed on. So there is a selection for fast and rapid responses to these types of environmental challenges, and therefore, these remain our default response to uncertainty. This is a figure from the neurologist Eduardo Benero showing what he describes as the central autonomic network. Uh, importantly for our discussion today is that whereas there's bidirectional communication throughout the neuraxis, the output of the set of neural structures goes to the sinal atrium of the heart via the stellate ganglia and the vagus nerve. Now we know this because uh, there have been uh, retrograde viral staining studies in both rodents and primates where you inject pseudorabies virus or something similar into the heart and over the course of time you watch where it goes. And uh, Gert Terhorst in the, the Netherlands was one of the first to uh, show this pathway <coughs> up through the nucleus tractus solitarius through the paraacoductal gray, amygdala, insula, cingulate cortex, all the way up to the prefrontal cortex. Notice, it's a relatively small number of synapses to get from the heart to the prefrontal cortex. How did Claude Bernard and Darwin know this? Still a mystery. Similar pathway from the gut, by the way. There are similar pathways from lots of organs in the body, and uh, I don't know if I'll have time, but uh, Peter Strick has done a lot of those types of studies at the University of Pittsburgh. Anyway, at, uh, this is a figure from Phil Saul showing that there are central 
respiratory, cardiopulmonary, and arterial barrier flex influences that go uh, via the brainstem to the sinal atrial node of the heart, via the vagus and the stellate ganglia. At the sinal atrial node of the heart, there are different neurokinetics. The uh, adrenergic or sympathetic pathway is relatively slow, order of magnitude of seconds, whereas the uh, cholinergic pathway, the vagal pathway, is fast, order of magnitude of milliseconds. Now, we often <clears throat> talk about sort of the fight or flight response as a sympathetically based response. But <clears throat> if you are uh, walking along the street here in Cologne and someone comes by on one of these scooters and you need to get out of the way, if you depend on your sympathetic nervous system, it's too slow. You have to uh, produce that increase in heart rate and blood pressure by a decrease in vagal function. The vag these uh, systems are tonically inhibited by the vagus. So in fact, adaptive fight or flight responses are often primarily vaguely mediated. As I indicated, there's a left and a right vagus. The uh, right vagus uh, neural inputs go selectively to the sinal atrial node of the heart. Left-sided neural inputs go selectively to the atrial ventricular node of the heart. So the right-sided neural inputs are primary in cardiac chronotropy, cardiac rate. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the parasympathetic nervous system influences are dominant. Uh, cardiac intrinsic uh, firing rate of the SA node cells is between 105 and 115 beats per minute. However, your normal resting heart rate is between 60 and 80 beats per minute, suggesting that the heart is under tonic inhibitory control by the vagus. This has to do with the uh, neurokinetics of acetylcholine and norepinephrine. And this is a, a figure from the classic paper by Warner and Cox showing that <clears throat> with vagus stimulation, there's a rapid decrease in heart rate. When the stimulation stops, there's a rapid increase. Contrast that with sympathetic stimulation, which has a slow rise time and a slow decay time. Clearly, uh, this is not the most adaptive response when you need to rapidly mobilize for action. <clears throat> so one of the ways in which we are able to assess vagal function is by heart rate variability, uh, where we look at the timing between heartbeats. This can be done uh, this is a cardiac interbeat interval uh, time series. This analysis can be done in the time domain or the frequency domain. In the time domain, we might get a measure of uh, overall variability, the variance, standard deviation, or of the high frequency variability in particular uh, using uh, what's called first differencing. Uh, it's the root mean square successive difference. And this is uh, effectively a high pass filter. In the context of uh, the frequency domain, we can do spectral analysis. This is an autoregressive uh, spectral plot. The vagal influences are over the whole range. Sympathetic influences tend to roll off at about 0.15 hertz. So the area in the yellow, the high frequency variability is due almost exclusively to vagal influences. This is a 2005 paper where, uh, in a rodent model, they uh, measured vagus nerve activity directly. And you can see it has a very strong relationship with this high frequency heart rate variability, so, suggesting that when we're measuring this high frequency heart rate variability, we're getting some uh, index of um, vagal activity. So normally when I give this talk, there's a, now a series of slides from Vaughn Macefield, uh, but I took them out because I assumed that he was going to talk about them himself. <laughs> so I won't spoil it. Vaughn will talk about it later. But I want to give you a little bit of overview of the anatomy and set the stage for the rest of the speakers today. Uh, oh, this is a very nice review paper, by the way, on uh, the vagus nerve. And just so you get some idea, so this is the vagus nerve nestled between uh, the internal jugular vein and the common carotid artery. So this so this is from a cadaver, obviously. Uh, so this uh, is the vagus nerve. And it's really like a cable. 
And there are a range of uh, types of vagal fibers. Uh, and uh, the vagus nervous system is a complicated neural network that maintains our body in psychophysiological balance. From an anatomical perspective, there are three types of fibers, A, B, and C fibers. Uh, small, unmyelinated C fibers primarily carry afferent visceral information, and depending upon the species, represent between 60 and 80 percent of the vagal fibers. Um, the primary uh, neurotransmitter is the acetylcholine, Vagerstuf, uh, and uh, there are non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic fibers uh, whose neurotransmitters include nitric oxide, among others. But <clears throat> up to 20% of the vagus nerve cross-sectional area in cervical and thoracic vagal trunks contains tyrosine hydroxylase, the enzyme responsible for dopamine and neuroadrenaline synthesis, suggesting a potential crosstalk to the sympathetic nervous system in vagus nervous function. And this is why I highlighted that while we separate sympathetic and parasympathetic, the fibers themselves may be intertwined. Um, again, uh, the, these fibers are characterized on the basis of their uh, size and conduction velocity. They have uh, a range of functions. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip a, a few things here. Uh, I think I may have to skip this also, but this is uh, very interesting for uh, those interested in vagus nerve stimulation. There are calibration thresholds for different uh, fibers. This is done in a rodent model. And uh, as uh, we had a discussion at dinner last night about how uh, the degree of stimulation necessary to trigger those C fibers may be greater than what most vagus nerve stimulation is doing. So the question is, are we getting A fibers, B fibers? What is the, uh, what's actually being stimulated when we're doing the vagus nerve stimulation? And they have different characteristics. Again, for the sake of time, I'll skip a little bit of this. Uh, this figure shows that there are two efferent nuclei, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus and nucleus ambiguous, and two afferent nuclei, uh, the nucleus tractus solitarius and the uh, um, spinal nucleus of the trigeminal. I want to point out a couple of things here. Uh, this is uh, nodos ganglia here. Uh, there is some uh, discussion uh, from uh, Steve Porges talking about the polyvagal theory, suggesting that the uh, output from the dorsal motor nucleus and from the nucleus ambiguous go to completely different places. Uh, that is not true. <laughs> uh, they actually overlap. And uh, it's a recent review in Autonomic Neuroscience by Berthold where he um, explicitly states that there is no evidence for the poly in the polyvagal. Uh, Steve Porges is a good friend of mine. We agree on most things with respect to heart rate variability, but the poly and the polyvagal is one area where we disagree. I want to highlight how the input to the uh, nucleus tractus solitarius <coughs> are important. So there are inputs from a wide range of vagal afferents that go to the NTS. The NTS is very interesting. It has subnuclei that are specialized for different processes, but they largely overlap. They have a lot of um, high degree of overlap, and they have a somatotopic organization, and that's really interesting. So uh, one wonders how the brain knows where these vagal signals are coming from. And it's because they have the somatotopic organization. There's some uh, suggestion that the somatotopic organization extends from the nucleus tractus 
from the NTS into the insula as well. There's some evidence for that, but it's not conclusive. Um, the NTS, however, is not just a passive uh, way station. The NTS also has interneurons and receives feed uh, input from uh, the area prostema, prostema as well. So both neural and blood-borne signals are uh, processed in the NTS. So the NTS actually does a, a fair amount of processing of signals, both on the afferent and efferent side, to produce uh, unified uh, physiological responses. This is why the vagus nervous system uh, seems to be associated with so many different things. And I often get this uh, question. People say, well, is, you know, heart rate variability of the vagus is associated with everything, so it's associated with nothing. And I have to point out, well, there's an anatomical reason why it's associated with everything. There's a physiological reason why this exists. OK, so that's a little bit of background of the physiology of the uh, vagus to sort of set the stage for the rest of the talks today. What I want to talk to you about in particular is some work uh, that we've been doing on vagal afferents. Now, <clears throat> there's a recent paper uh, highlighting uh, how peripheral signals are actually driving neural activity. And what they are proposing in this model is that fluctuating levels of arousal drive uh, neural networks associated with uh, functional connectivity. And this is in the fMRI context. So this is a paper from Marcus uh, Rakel's group. And what they propose is that there's a spatiotemporal arousal cycle that goes from uh, unimodal to transmodal uh, systems, so unimodal like motor visual, to transmodal uh, like the dorsal uh, attention and default mode network, and that there's a relationship between uh, ultra slow arousal patterns and uh, functional connectivity networks in the brain. So what they were able to show is that uh, respiratory variation and heart rate variability, as well as pupil size, uh, were uh, driving these uh, neural systems, both uh, unimodal and transmodal, and with a particular phase relationship So not only at the cortex, but at subcortical regions as well. And they looked at this by looking at uh, sort of the phase relations and looked at the lead-lag relationships between uh, these peripheral signals and uh, bold signal variability. So what our group has been doing, uh, so the bold signal uh, has some advantages, but has some disadvantages. One of which is uh, in doing neuroimaging, the time constants associated with getting bold signals uh, is not at the same level as some of these peripheral signals. So we've been using uh, EEG. So this is uh, data from a paper that's under review with uh, Kaya Sargent a student at UCLA, and Cindy Yee Bradbury and Greg uh, Miller, her advisors. So we've looked at this using uh, different uh, EEG bands. This is just illustrating gamma and theta, and high frequency heart rate variability. And we were interested in the um, hypothesized phased amplitude coupling between the heart rate variability, vaguely mediated heart rate variability signal, and the neural oscillations in these different frequency bands. So what this figure shows <clears throat> is a representative subject. 
This is the time series. This is the autoregressive spectral analysis. This is the time series uh, filtered at the participant's peak high frequency heart rate uh, uh, variability frequency. And these are the phase angles for the uh, high frequency heart rate variability time series in the 20 second window. And these are the amplitude time series for the alpha EEG oscillations in that same 20 second time window. So <clears throat> what we can see is that the average amplitude of these alpha oscillations in uh, each phase bin of the uh, HRV oscillations for a representative participant, and you can see that those are in a rhythmic pattern. And we looked at the uh, uh, magnitude of the observed modulation index between these different frequency bands and the high frequency heart rate uh, variability signal. And you can see that for all frequency bands, uh, they were uh, significantly uh, related with relatively uh, large effect sizes. The largest were for alpha and for delta. And using uh, Granger causality, we assessed the phase relationship between those peripheral cardiac signals and the different frequency bands. And what you can see is that the number of participants showing significant heart to brain was much greater than the number of participants showing significant brain to heart modulation, suggesting that <clears throat> these vagal afferents, these cardiac signals, are actually driving the neural signals as uh, was shown with the fMRI. Uh, this is, these are some heat maps showing uh, the red indicates uh, greater brain-to-heart effects, the blue, excuse me, the red shows greater heart-to-brain effects, the blue greater uh, brain-to-heart effects, and the black dots represent the uh, specific sites in which the brain-to-heart, excuse me, the heart-to-brain correlation was greater than the brain to heart. And you can see for delta and alpha, numerous sites, and that it's mostly heart to brain. Uh, in uh, another study uh, published with some colleagues in Italy, uh, we looked at changes in uh, delta oscillations related to uh, heart rate decelerations. And what we found was that, uh, again, in a uh, prefrontal region, uh, the odds of a decrease in delta predicting a longer interbeat interval was significant. And Again, this was specific to the vaguely mediated component of heart rate variability and not with heart rate per se. In a paper published last year, again with some colleagues in Italy, uh, we uh, looked at uh, this in the context of emotional arousal. And uh, you know, there's this long debate uh, about the relationship between bodily states and emotion. Uh, this is sort of the uh, James Lang theory of emotion, actually. Uh, and uh, while the in involvement of these uh, bodily activity in emotion physiology is widely recognized, the specificity and causal role of sex activity to brain dynamics has not been demonstrated. We hypothesize that this peripheral neural control on cardiovascular activity prompts and sustains brain dynamics during an emotional experience. So, that, so these afferent inputs are processed by the brain by triggering a concurrent efferent information transfer to the body. To this end, we investigated this functional heart-brain interplay uh, 
during a motion elicitation in a publicly available uh, data set of 62 participants using a, a computational model based on synthetic data generation of EEG and ECG. And we found <clears throat> that the sympathovagal activity plays a leading <clears throat> and causal role in initiating the emotional response in which ascending modulations from vagal activity precede neurodynamics correlated to the reported level of arousal. And I'll show you the details of this momentarily. The subsequent dynamic interplay observed between the central and autonomic nervous systems sustains this processing of the emotional arousal. And uh, these findings have some interesting implications. We just another review of this. <clears throat> so what we show here, in this particular case, we looked at, again, those same frequency bands. But uh, we looked at the high frequency heart rate variability as well as the low frequency heart rate variability. And this is the heart to brain um, uh, maps, sh uh, polar histograms showing uh, the relationship at the various frequencies. These are the brain to heart. Again, it's still uh, primarily vaguely mediated. And <clears throat> We show that this is specific to the arousal level of the emotion, not associated with valence. And you can see that the uh, high frequency to theta relationship maps with arousal, high frequency to uh, delta maps with arousal, and the high frequency to gamma also tracks with arousal and not valence. Uh, again, this is just another representation showing that the heart to brain uh, uh, communication is linked to arousal, and that this heart to brain is stronger than the brain to heart. And you see that much less so for valence. So, what we, uh, and this is just shows over the course of the exposure to these emotional arousing film clips, you can see that it's primarily high frequency heart rate variability and it's primarily heart to brain that's driving this for the different emotion conditions and even for the neutral. So it seems that uh, this type of uh, relationship communication between the periphery and the central nervous system may serve a driving and causal role in cortical activations. Now sleep researchers, and we published some work in uh, sleep as well, in which uh, they have been reporting that the changes in autonomic activity have preceded changes in EEG during sleep as well. So it's during sleep, during wake and rest, during emotion. So this seems like it's a general phenomenon that these arousal signals from the periphery are driving neural activity, producing functional connectivity and networks that we are all been looking at. So the um, implications that uh, uh, Marcus Frakel's group concluded from their study was that, you know, when we're doing fMRI, we often include covariates to remove these signals from our fMRI uh, activity. And they call into question the uh, uh, wisdom of removing such an important source of the actual neural activity. So it has some interesting implications for how we do our uh, fMRI studies. Uh, uh, with uh, Simona Battaglia, we uh, published a paper in uh, sort of a thought paper, as it were, in Trends in Neuroscience last year, where we talk about the role of these uh, vagal afferents in um, human fear conditioning and again showing um, 
the uh, importance of the parasympathetic influence in uh, fear conditioning and how this is relatively inhibited in, uh, rel in normal situations. Uh, with some uh, colleagues here in Germany, including Julian Koenig, we have investigated uh, heart rate variability and uh, inhibition in conditioned fear responses. Here we're using a, a conditioning paradigm, uh, AX plus BX minus, where we pair geometric symbols with either uh, shock or uh, no shock. And then we put these geometric signals, symbols together and uh, look at how the uh, participant responds. And we also are interested in extinction. And what we found in this particular study was that those individuals with low resting heart rate variability had poor extinction and also uh, perceived the uh, AB stimulus more as a threat than as a safety signal, whereas those with higher resting heart rate variability, it was more they showed greater extinction, and the AB response was more like a safety signal. So this has some important implications uh, for a range of psychological processes. OK, so one of the things that we uh, then did with my colleague uh, Mara Mather, uh, we did a trial. So if, under naturalistic circumstances, these peripheral signals are driving uh, central activity, what if we manipulated the peripheral signals by having people do uh, slow, deep breathing to increase their heart oscillations and these afferent signals to the brain? What would happen if we did this? So uh, Mara has a fantastic group, uh, and these are just sort of some of the people involved in this project. One of the first papers uh, we published on uh, this uh, appeared in uh, Cognitive Affective Behavioral Neuroscience. And this was uh, a randomized trial uh, where we had younger and older individuals. This just shows sort of the flow diagram and the types of measures that were taken at each of the different uh, settings. This was a five-week intervention where we had individuals do uh, slow breathing, which might be considered resonance frequency breathing. Uh, these are, this shows the range of measures that we took over the course of this. But what we did was we had individuals, we gave them feedback to increase their heart rate oscillations. And we um, individualized the frequency at which this breathing was done. And interestingly, the control condition uh, was similar feedback, but the feedback was to remain, uh, maintain a slow, steady heart rate. So we gave them similar instructions. And we couch this in the context of meditation. So the oscillation plus group versus the oscillation minus group. So meditation is known to have remarkable effects on emotional health outcomes. It can calm you down, reduces stress and anxiety. So for the oscillation plus group, we said, some meditative practices lead to large but smooth oscillations in heart rate called coherence. For the oscillation minus group, we, they got the same beginning. Meditation is known to have these remarkable effects. Some meditative practices lead to a low and steady heart rate. And what you can see is that for the oscillation plus group, during the home biofeedback training, they showed these large oscillations. For the oscillation minus group, we did not see evidence of those large oscillations. Here, when you look at the spectral analysis, uh, you see a large peak in the uh, 0.1 hertz range for the oscillation plus group, no such peak for the oscillation minus group. So we were pretty effective in getting the large oscillations. What we were able to show was that in a range of 
uh, neural networks, particularly with respect to emotion and interception, there is an increase in the connectivity uh, pre to post. So let me just uh, take a half step back. So this intervention involved five weeks in a group of older and younger individuals. Uh, there are about 120 young individuals. We had about half of that in the older because it was interrupted by COVID. Uh, and uh, we had them do this home biofeedback between 20 and 40 minutes a day for five weeks, five weeks only. And we found this change in the functional connectivity, in particular in this emotion interception network. We also looked at connectivity in a particular uh, network involving the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. We had previously shown that uh, the functional connectivity of that network was correlated with heart rate variability, so greater heart rate variability in both younger and older individuals, more connectivity between the medial prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. And what we were able to show is that the oscillation plus group showed increased functional connectivity in that same prefrontal amygdala network after five weeks. Um, so uh, just a couple of last slides here. Uh, uh, Julian Koenig had organized a meta-analysis looking at cortical thickness and heart rate variability. And um, this is over, uh, over 1,200 individuals and showed that heart rate variability was associated with uh, cortical thickness in a number of prefrontal regions. This is just a, a graphical presentation of that. And uh, what we found in our biofeedback study was that five weeks of this training also increased cortical thickness in that, those same uh, regions. Uh, finally, uh, we um, measured plasma, uh, amyloid beta, and tau levels in younger and older individuals. And uh, this is just a um, schematic of our experimental procedure. Again, um, randomization of our young and old individuals. And what we were able to show in both the young and old is that the oscillation plus group led to decreases in amyloid beta 42 and amyloid beta 40. Uh, one of the things that was a little bit uh, troubling is that the oscillation plus group showed an increase, excuse me, the oscillation minus group showed an increase uh, in those amyloid levels. We don't know if there was something specific to that particular control condition. So we have just been funded for another trial to look at uh, these factors. Uh, we've extended the training to 10 weeks, uh, and we have a, a more neutral, let's say, control condition to see if uh, this is just an effect of time in these individuals or if the other breathing condition actually was not such a good thing for them. OK, for the sake of time, um, this is a, a study from Richard Lane's group showing that the slow, uh, low frequency heart rate variability is, in fact, vaguely mediated. Because when you block vagus, this variability, even in these slow breathing frequencies, more or less goes away. If you block, uh, if you infuse saline or sympathetic blocker, more or less no effect. So it's almost exclusively vaguely mediated. So I'll skip a bunch of stuff here and jump to the conclusions. <laughs> so the brain and the heart are intimately connected. Uh, vagal afferents play an important role. Heart rate variability biofeedback influences the brain, and this effect is almost exclusively vaguely mediated. So I started with a quote from Darwin, and this is a quote that is often attributed to Darwin, but is actually from Meganson, uh, and 
it states that it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And what I'd like to propose is that uh, uh, index of vagus nerve activity provides a measure of the degree to which the organism is responsive to change and therefore is adaptive. So these vagal afferents and the ability to manipulate them by doing um, behavioral interventions uh, may have important implications. Thank you. We are also responsive to change, so worst case scenario, we delay the lunch a bit, uh, but taking questions for Dr. Thayer now. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. I'm wondering which biophysical mechanisms are responsible for the rapid action of the parasympathetic nervous system. Are those mechanisms within the brain, or is it due to myelinated, non-myelinated fibers? Or is it due to the different channel structures involved with the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches? Could you? Well, that's a very good question. And I think uh, Vaughn will answer this this afternoon in some more detail. Uh, but uh, with respect to the uh, vagal afferents and uh, vagus nerve stimulation in particular, it's unclear uh, what's actually being. Um, what's driving those effects that have been reported. So uh, as we were discussing last night, it seems like it should be the C fibers, but the stimulation parameters are probably not sufficient to stimulate the C fibers. Uh, there's some evidence that it may be, in fact, those sympathetic fibers that are in the vagus that may be driving this. Some people have proposed that. So this is an area of, of uh, active research, so we don't actually know in any great detail. Um, um, Eric Krauss, who has recently moved from the University of Florida to Georgia State University, uh, has proposed that there are oxytocin uh, neurons that may be responsible for some of this. In his uh, animal models, he, he's done some um, optogenetic studies suggesting that that might be a pathway for both the neural and mechano uh, sensations that are carried by the vagus. So, uh, there's an active area of research we don't really know for sure. Mark, um, as you illustrated beautifully in the NTS, the NTS is not just wave passing signals, but there is some neuromodulation going on also by releasing certain peptides or real bunch of peptides. Why would you then assume so signals are delayed, are um, modulated? Why would you assume a direct coupling between signals? that are vaguely modulated and an oscillation EG. So I don't know if it's a, a direct coupling. I mean, the correlation is not perfect that we're reporting. Uh, but uh, again, both the uh, study from Marcus Rakel's group with the fMRI, the bold signals, and our studies with the EEG suggest that there is a uh, directional driving from the heart to the brain that uh, seems not to uh, seems to be different than the signal coming from the brain to the heart, which is what most of us have been studying these efferent signals. So uh, I think that um, the work on the afferent part is really uh, just developing and getting some uh, more insights. We don't really know. I mean, it's an area that we should be doing. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding your first uh, slides. Uh, you mentioned that if there is in, in the brain a higher inhibitory tone, you have a higher heart rate variability. So is it not very wrong? If there is a higher inhibitory tone in the brain, you have a lower heart rate, uh, heart rate variability? Uh, the short answer is yes. We have a paper under review with Christina Ottaviani, a uh, uh, spectroscopy uh, study that we did where we looked at glutamate and uh, GABA levels and uh, higher heart rate variability is associated with higher GABA lev levels in the prefrontal cortex but not with glutamate. And if it's so, um, I'm working on excitation inhibition balance in the cortex 
and have a high excitability, we have a high excitability in psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia. Do we have a lower heart rate variability due to the higher rhythm of the tone in the so this is what we think, and in uh, fact, this particular study was done with individuals that had, uh, uh, you could consider uh, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, that is, they were high worriers, and we had them actually do a bout of worrying, uh, and uh, we, looked, we saw the changes in the glutamate and the GABA levels as a function of this worry induction. So, yeah. The paper's under review. We've sent it to some places that didn't like it, so we're... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, So in those studies when you use biofeedback and meditative breathing and uh, brain activity, connectivity, and so on, did you also assess some kind of emotional state, whether anxiety reduced in those participants? So... Uh, what we, there were, yes, is the short answer, and what we found was uh, that at a sort of a trait level, both uh, conditions reduce depression and anxiety. So that's why we're trying this other uh, control condition as well, to see if we can see some differential effects. But what we did see that was differential was um, um, emotion regulation differences. So the Oscillation Plus group had better uh, emotion uh, regulation as indexed by their performance in a uh, task where they had to either upregulate or downregulate their responses to positive, negative, and neutral images. So we saw it at that level, but not at, sort of at the trait level of depression and anxiety. Consistent with our sort of instructions that meditation may have beneficial effects, both groups actually showed uh, beneficial effects on anxiety and depression. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.